part of my normal life. I know things without people saying things to me. I see somebody and I can tell you, I can talk for like five minutes about who they are. Wow. And, and I just by seeing that, I can tell you about the quality of their personality, how they understand the world, how they interact with life. Um, I can't tell you necessarily where they were born or because I know my logical mind doubts that. Um, I can feel that resistance coming up, but I can tell you like everything about them non-physically, um, all these characteristics. And if I go into a channeled state, then I can bring through even more information. My guest today is Lincoln Gergar, and he is a channeler. So this is the very first time that I have ever had anybody on my show who does channeling. And I fell in love with Lincoln's story. And when I heard him channel, I was riveted and I just felt something. And it felt to me, the word I guess that I would say is truth. So I'm really excited that Lincoln, thank you so much for agreeing to come on and, and talk to my audience today. Yeah, thank you, Laurie. I appreciate this opportunity. And I'm so glad that you've been resonating with my videos and the higher self energy and the messages that come through. Well, you are prolific with your videos. I didn't know that YouTube had been around as long as it had. I think you said you started back in 2007. Yeah, yeah, I started in 2007 and YouTube had just been acquired by Google. So before that it was a small startup and it just so happened because I wasn't really wasn't on the internet much, but just so happened that I saw an announcement on some website that YouTube was bought by Google and I thought, "Oh, what's this? It's a video service online." And that was literally like a month before I did my first video recording, which was actually the first time I ever channeled through my mouth. Wow. Well, and that's incredible because I want to set the stage. People often forget 2007 sounds like a long time ago, but when we're talking about phones in 2007, I had a flip phone. I could take about 15 pictures on it before it would fill up. Texting was the three characters and texting was so new. Like people weren't doing that. So for you to have been drawn to videos and having no idea what YouTube would ultimately become. And I think you said on one interview that you have like 2,600 videos that you have produced. Yeah. Yeah. I have over 2,600 now. So I've been doing it since 2007. And it was interesting that you gave this rundown of technology because even though like my whole career has been making these online videos, I hadn't owned a cell phone until like I don't know, four years ago, five years Whoa. ago. Yeah. So I've always tried to just stay away from technology, not because it's evil or bad or wrong, but just because I didn't always want to be available. I liked my quiet. I liked my peace. Yeah. I'd spend a lot of time in nature. And for me, the people that I loved were very close in my life and I'd see them in person. Or if I wanted to interact with them, I'd send them an email or I'd call them up. So even oh. though, you know, I kind of got my start along with YouTube, um, I've been outside of the tech spectrum uh, just for various reasons from a personal self. So yeah, I've seen a, a lot of changes, a lot of remarkable changes in the ability to reach people because of how much the internet has developed. And I'm really fortunate that I've been doing this since 2007 because it allowed me to create this large library of teachings and channel videos. And that's been really doing well to help a lot of people. Well, I'll put a link up here so people can reach you on your YouTube channel and check out all of the content that you have because you really largely, for the most part, have your content free and, and available for no cost because I think there is no accident that you were drawn to a technology that was going to be so large in the in the world, really, for people to be able to access your your teaching. So I don't think that there's an accident in any of that. No, no. Yeah, not at all. And for me, it was really just a desire to put out this information. Um, when I was in college, I first came along with spiritual teachings, and I really loved them. And my human understanding was like, I don't need to be a teacher, like the information's already out there, just go to the library, find the books. And then when it started having when I started having the experience of channeling, the channeling energy and the channeling consciousness wanted to put itself out there. So I just created free videos 
and I still do that. Every week I post a new video and it's been almost 20 years of time. And then for the first 17 years, I did everything by donation. So I would work with people one-on-one -on -one and they could donate any amount they wanted to just because I wanted to help humanity and I wanted to, to share the message. But That's then at beautiful. some point, <laughs> but then at some point I just felt right. You know, it just felt like the right thing to do. I um, mean, at some point I just got so busy and I just needed to, you know, kind of set some guidelines so that I had some free time in my own personal life. Sure. So I started setting a price and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just for me, my desire was really to be in the channeled state as often as I could and to try to help this world as best that I could by sharing whatever gifts I have. You said that you've channeled thousands of times. So I'm curious. I know that I talk to a lot of people who have had near-death experiences. And a lot of times when they come back, they receive what we'll call, I guess, gifts or different abilities that they did not have before. And you, my friend, have had some really extraordinary, probably ineffable um, experiences, but as much as you can with the human words that we are limited to, would you please share some of your, what you would consider your most profound and life-changing experiences with us? Yeah, certainly. Um, so I can, oh, there's probably four real powerful ones that come to mind. Okay, I would love to hear all of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the first one, um, I was maybe like six, seven, eight or nine years old. And I remember that age group because of how the furniture was arranged in my bedroom at the time. So I was sleeping at night and I woke up in my dream state, but it was extremely vivid. And there was this tall being next to me with a long beard, a gray beard, wearing like a robe. Um, and he was beside me. And I was like a little kid, even in the vision that I was having non-physically, I was you know, a nine-year-old self. And this was an older man who looked to be like 80. <laughs> and uh, and I was standing next to him like a young child would hold a grown-up's hand. And then um, in front of me then appeared this older woman and then this other younger child. And so that was my first experience of really being introduced to like my soul family and a group of non-physical beings who would then be continue to be part of my life from that point forward. Right. And, so and that was you very explain vivid. soul family, because I, I understand what you're talking about when you say that, but maybe somebody who's watching is newer to spirituality and they haven't heard that term or really don't understand it. So from your perspective, I'd like to know what you call a soul family. Yeah, sure. Um, so we're all eternal states of consciousness. And we project ourselves into these human realities. My experience is that the human reality is held within my consciousness. So I'm projecting myself into an experience and that experience is within me at the same time. You can think of it kind of like putting water or putting a sponge into a glass of water. The water surrounds the sponge, but the water also gets absorbed into the sponge. That's kind of mm -hmm. like what we're doing. We're putting ourselves into the space of the human body and plugging our creative energy and our intelligence into the material body. But then we also fill out that aura that surrounds our body. Okay. So we're these non-physical states of consciousness and we exist for eternity because the universe exists for eternity and God exists for eternity. We're that unexplainable mystery. We're that which has always been. So going back to my vision, when I was a young kid, I would lay in bed at night and I would think about these types of questions. I would think about like the nature of reality and what am I and what is God? Because you learn about this in church, you know, so you're trying to process as a young kid. And I was a real deep thinker. And I was trying to understand like, what is God? What exists forever? And the conclusion I came to is there's this thing that we all have to be that could never have been created. It just is. It's the great mystery. And that's one thing they call it in Taoism. It's the great mystery. We don't know what consciousness is or how it got here. It just is. And when I was like 10 years old or so, like I was blowing up my mind thinking about these things. Yeah, so um, this is really crazy. There, I have a memory of myself being six or seven. And I would remember I would sit in my parents' room. They had this dresser with these squares on it. And if I could put my fingers over my eyes, I would see those squares and they would go in this pattern and then they would disappear. And I would have the same thought over and over again. And it was, what if there is nothing 
nothing is something. And it was like this round and round thing that I could never solve. I'm not even really sure what it meant, but it was there for many years when I was really little, probably from like this age of six to nine. And it sounds kind of similar to what you were. So why do you think some of us come here and have those bigger thoughts that we really wouldn't have the ability to process as that at that age. Yeah, we're waking up. Uh, like for me, I had this non-physical experience that was really profound where I met these beings that were as real as human beings. And I learned things while I was on the other side. So that was my human self starting to remember some of my eternal qualities. And as I listen to your story, as you close your eyes and you're seeing the light, you're starting to move your consciousness out of the physical spectrum of energy, and you're starting to perceive the non-physical spectrum of energy. So when you go into that non-physical state, you're accessing your non-physical intelligence. When we're in the body, we think we're the body and we think like our memories and our human concepts. And as soon as we start to perceive more of our light body, then we start to gather the understanding that the light body has, like remembering our purpose, remembering our past lifetimes, understanding these cosmic questions about the nature of reality. So I think a lot of us have chosen to come into this particular time in this world Mm -hmm. to benefit the awakening of mankind. And so we pop in as souls at a young age and we're, we all think different. We're very creative, you know, we're out of the box and we have a lot of these mystical experiences. And for myself, I had no one to get answers from, you know, no one in my family studied spirituality. I grew up in a farming community. I had Christianity for my answers. And a lot of the questions I had weren't answerable by reading the Bible (laughs) or talking to the the priests and the nuns. So you really had to kind of just go on your own journey. And then at a certain point of time, especially with the internet, all this information became available to us. So when I was 18, it blew my mind. Like I started reading spiritual books. I had no idea that there's this type of information out there, that there's people who lived hundreds of years ago and they talk about going into other dimensions and they talk about like the truth of reality and how you can experience it by learning to stop your own thought activity. It's like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is what I've always known was here or possible or real. And finally, someone's talking about it. So that, yeah, that little fire in me and I changed everything. I was supposed to, I was going, I choose it, but I was going to be a medical doctor. Like I was, I was going down this pathway of being like, you know, in the world and of the world. And the day after I graduated high school, the next day I found my first spiritual book and I read it. What was it? What was it? um, (laughs) It was Carlos Castaneda's Teachings of Don Juan. So it's a, it's a book that was written in UCLA, I think in the 1970s the early 70s. And so there was a graduate student at UCLA in anthropology, and he wanted to do his thesis on studying the hallucinogenic plants of the native traditions. And he was a grad student. So he was, you know, just excited about, you know, studying, uh, you know, different plant medicines, and like peyote and things like that that are available just outside of California in the Sonoran Desert in northern Mexico. And so he was going there just to study plants. And he actually got introduced into an entire world of shamanism, and other dimensions of reality and non physical beings and out of body experience and all these wild things. Very familiar with that. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So that, that was my first spiritual book, and it blew my mind. Yeah. So you said something in the very beginning when you were talking about your experience at six or seven that intrigued me. You said you learned things on the other side. So can you explain yeah. a little bit about what you have learned in those states when um, you, know, you started your yeah. journey? Yeah, the most significant learning is, I think it's kind of similar to what you shared about being in eternity. Um, You learn about the nature of reality. <sighs> Like when you so experience, what is it? <laughs> yeah. the big, the big million dollar question. Words. Yeah, uh, you experience. You have experiences that change how you process existence itself. Like, like human things, they don't matter anymore. Like you still interact and you still do things. Um, a good example is when I was twenty. I think I was 20 years old. I had my first experience of someone channeling for me and uh, a beautiful woman. And she channels this higher dimensional being. He was human at one point and I'd never experienced channeling before. And 
part of the message that I got, because I have actually recorded, I have a recording of it from like 20 years ago. It's real cool. Um, The part of the message I got is that Lincoln, one thing we love about you is you don't get upset about anything. And it's like, yeah, when you know you're eternal, like all these little human things, they don't really matter. Like you still want to have a human life but you don't like get so entangled with hope and desire and suffering to where you think you're pulled around to these states of suffering. Like I still have desires and I'm still creating things and I go through human emotions, but I know they're not important. Like they're real because they're happening, but they're not important. So the human emotions and the human story becomes part of the the life I'm creating, but it doesn't touch my soul. It's like, well, I'm if the that's not important, of, what yeah. is important? Oh, can you say that again? So if that's not important, what is important? Ah, what is important? It's For me, it's really just been the experience of being that eternal consciousness. Because like the falsehoods of who we think we are are covering over the bliss, the peace, the happiness of our natural state. Mm-hmm. And so when I just feel myself as consciousness, I feel incredibly happy. And I'm happy just because I'm life energy and life energy is blissful. I didn't get anything. I just got in touch with myself beyond my human form. So me experiencing myself out of these states changed how I understand my existence, my experience in the present moment and how to interpret the different forms that I'm interacting with. Like another state I had, I was doing um, like a 30 day breatharian meditation. So when I graduated college, I didn't want to go right in and get a job. So I had some money saved up from my jobs during college and I had a window of time. So I said, okay, I'm going to spend a month as soon as I'm done with college. And all I'm going to do is meditate in my room. Wow. (laughs) So all I did was meditate in my room, no distractions. I'd wake up in the morning and I was using some teachings by this breatharian teacher called Joss Muheen. So Joss Muheen, she um, was one of the first teachers of how to gather energy and feed your body with energy. And that was something very interesting to me at the time. So I was doing these practices in one of her books called Food of the Gods. And I was also doing other forms of meditation, such as my Zen style of meditation and things like this. And maybe like two or three weeks into this meditative retreat that I was giving to myself, it was like 10 a.m. in the morning and I felt incredibly tired. And I never feel tired during the day. And it was really strong. And I thought, wow, I have to go lay down in my bed. So I go to my bedroom and as soon as I lay down, I don't even remember myself laying down. I was out in another dimension and I was in a realm in which everything was white light. There was nothing else but white light everywhere. And I was the white light and there was no time and there was no self-reflection. Like there was no understanding I'm having this experience but I was aware of it and I was having the experience. I was completely aware of it, but I wasn't processing it. So there was no time because time is about referencing change and about referencing my existence in comparison to something else. Because what gives us the perception of time is the notice of change. So we have to notice different things, different forms in ourself. So time was absent. It was an eternal present moment and it was all this white light and it was such, such blissful love. Yeah. And, and so that was this state I was in. And then after being there for, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds, it's kind of hard because you're not in time, but maybe 30 seconds of time. Then I had a recognition that I'm having this experience and it was a knowing, a knowing recognition that I'm having this experience. I reflected for the first time and then my mind came back. And when my mind came back, that white light started to fade away. And then what started appearing behind this white light was the physical bedroom that I was in. And it's very bright at that point. It's very brilliant. Like the sun was lighting up everything. And then I realized I could feel that my eyelids were closed. So I was seeing my bedroom so brilliant and I could feel my eyelids were closed. And then I opened my eyelids and I saw the same vision of my room. So I was seeing with my mind's eye at that point. Um, But it was so profound. 
and this energy I felt, this bliss I felt, and the knowing was that I am this life energy. I'm this blissful light, this white light that is just absolutely blissful, and it just feels completely alive. For me, the energy of life is blissful. And I remember opening the, the sliding glass door to my bedroom, and I went outside, and I'm just seeing all the plants, and I'm because I have lots of plants in my yard, and I'm just looking around at the world, and I'm kind of mesmerized, and just recognizing and understanding like everything is this light. This whole reality I'm seeing was just the light changing into a different appearance. Mm. So everything is this original light and the intelligence of God and our own personal intelligence becomes aware of it and then starts interacting with it and gives it its shape. Wow. That is very profound. So you said you had four <laughs> profound experiences. That sounds like two to me, the one that you were when you were young and then this one. Can you share uh, yeah. the other two? Um, yeah, there's the, the going, the sucking out. Oh yes. The, okay. That's and, three for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was the crown chakra one when I was, I was sitting at this campground and, uh, meditating on a campfire. And I said, I'm going to sit here and I'm not going to move until like something happens. And I decided to sit there and took about three hours of sitting meditation. And then I ended up this, uh, <laughs> this head appeared in the space. <laughs> So this non-physical face started appearing in the space in front of me because I'm doing open-eyed Zen style meditation. Open-eyed too. Yeah, there's a campfire in front of me. Yes, yeah, so I'm seeing the physical environment and this face starts appearing in the ethers, like in the space. And I had to learn how to focus on it with my awareness and not lose it. Because if I look too much at physical forms, I would lose that which was appearing in the space. So I, I had to learn how to hold this in my in my awareness and it took like 20 minutes of really paying attention to these subtle shifts in how I'm perceiving because perception is a process. And so we can control our perception and perceive different realities. I can like perceive non-physical psychic things. I can look around the world and perceive things. So I'm learning how to hold in my perception this head that's appearing there. And then as I held it in my consciousness, it started to become more vivid. It had more detail and it looked like a Tibetan Buddhist's head, like nice and round, you know, and like big cheeks and looked like a Tibetan Buddhist head. And I was like, huh, okay. And then I started to telepath to it. So I was 19 at the time and I'm learning how to telepath from my mind to this head that's kind of see-through and like floating in space. And eventually I learned how to listen to it and trust that I was actually hearing this different voice speak back to me. And then for the next I don't know, hour or two, I had a conversation with it and it was asking me questions. I was asking it questions and it was bringing out of me these pieces of knowledge that I had been studying by reading all these ancient spiritual books, mainly from India and China and Japan and Tibet, because I really focus on Eastern spirituality in college. So I was getting asked these questions and bringing up this information. And it's like this higher intelligence was giving me an exam. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I went through all these questions and I got to this question where it asked me, like, what's the nature of reality or what's the highest truth or something like that? I forget the exact question, but my answer, which I do remember, was that I am pure consciousness and everything is pure consciousness. And then the, the, the head, the Tibetan head said, do you believe that? Like, do you really believe that? And I said, yes, like I, I know it, like logically I could deduce all the logic and all the reason to understand everything has to be God. It has to be one consciousness and nothing's outside of it. And it has to be this original void state that is beyond all the forms. Like I knew all the information so well and it's asked me, but do you really know it? Do you believe in that? Do you trust it? And that I answered it at one point, like, yes, I do. And then I felt this knowing come up inside of me that in order for me to actually really understand what I was reading in all these books, I had to experience it. And at that point of feeling this knowing, my root chakra started to get energized with all this fire. And it was like a furnace inside of me. And like the Kundalini was starting to wake up in a really powerful way. 
And before that, I'd have like electric shocks in my body and like, you know, movements and jolts. But this was like a blazing inferno at the bottom of my spine. And I realized at this point that I need to be willing to give myself this experience of pure consciousness. And to do that, I have to be willing to let go of being human. And like what was going through my my mind at the time was I have to be willing to die and never come back to this world at all. Because like my giving up of my identification with form and knowing myself at consciousness has to be so, so strong, so unpolluted that I have to really be willing to leave this reality and risk that I will never return to it again. So that's what my mind's processing at this time while all this Kundalini is starting to build up inside of me. And I made a choice that, yes, I'm willing to leave my entire human experience behind and never come back. So did you pass the exam? I shot out of the top of my head. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the Kundalini took me out like a rocket ship. It was this huge one burst and it just shot me up and I flew out of the top of my head. And then I was existing as with no body and I was perceiving in all directions. And it was a strange perception that you could perceive in 360 degrees at the same time because I saw this light and I didn't know what this light was. And I thought it was like the light of God. And then when I came back into my body, I turned around and I realized it was the light of the bathhouse in the campground. Um, Uh Wasn't the light of God. It was a toilet. (laughs) Well, I'm I'm curious because you mentioned that it was the root chakra that fell on fire. To me, when I hear root chakra, that's the part of us that goes in and grounds us to this reality. So why was that happening? Oh, because it's death. Because I had to let go of this reality completely, which means I had to unhook my consciousness from where I connect in, where I anchor in. Which like was the root chakra. The root so you chakra, were actually, yeah. it was on fire because it was releasing. Yes. All my soul's energy was oh. disconnecting. It's The Kundalini energy is our creative energy. I don't think it's some god or goddess. I think it's our energy. We, we come down through the crown and we anchor the energy into our root chakra. And that's what connects us into the body. And then we start to experience ourselves through the body. And we incorrectly believe I am the body instead of understanding I'm the consciousness and I'm the power that animates the body. I'm the power of the chakra system. I'm the energy inside of it. Wow. So the, yeah, so the root chakra is about survival, your human identity security, trust, safety, um, reproduction. It's all of these things that make us biological, temporary forms of life. Mm -hmm. And so I had to let go of that and say, you know what, like I'm willing to die and leave behind my family. And that's what came up for me was this, this question of you're going to leave behind your family and your family, like my parents, I thought about leaving behind my parents. I have two brothers, but it was more about leaving behind my parents because they are the strongest psychological influence we have. And I was 18 or 19 at the time, so I was still very much shaped by them. I I was in college, but I'd come home on break and I'd live with them. I had a really close relationship with my parents, so I had to be willing to never see them again, which like that was an existential challenge for me. But I wanted to know that I am pure consciousness more than I wanted to hold on to being human and not knowing what that experience would be like. Well, it sounds like these experiences are actually what probably opened you up to being able to channel. So would you like to speak to that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, so those happened. Well, the first one I was like, I don't know, six, seven, eight or nine. I was a young kid. Um, so that opened me up to non-physical interaction. And I remember laying in bed at night, asking all these questions and thinking them through and mm. I'm, I know I was accessing a higher part of my intelligence. I don't think it's the same or at least not the same wholeness that I have now when I channel the higher self, but I was definitely connecting more into that part of myself in a small, small way, even to just be able to process this type of information when you're a little kid. So I always had that connection when mm-hmm. I was young as well. I was counseling <laughs> kids when I was in grade school, um, I knew things. I had experiences where I would know what was going to happen and then it would happen. Can Um, can you give us a couple of examples? Because that's fascinating uh, to me. Some of it I can talk about. Yeah, because some involves my family. Okay. Um, But, uh, okay. Um, Well, one thing 
I used to have lucid dreams when I was like 14, 15. That's Not when everybody started. knows what lucid dreams are. So okay. <laughs> blowing people's minds. But you too. probably are. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a lucid dream is a, a dream you're having, but you wake up consciously inside the dream and you participate in it as if you are the person in the dream. So you're aware. So, you're aware. Yeah, you're aware and you can interact. Right. Yeah, because right. most of the dreams were more witnessing. Of course. And there's, yeah. a, there's a quality of vividness that happens when it's a lucid dream. Everything becomes bright and the emotional quality becomes very strong and it becomes more real. Okay. So around the age of 13 or 14 and continued until about I was 16 or 17, I had lucid dreams and these dreams were premonitional. So I would be in locations where I never was before. And usually my friends would be around, some of my friends, but then there'd be other kids that I didn't know who they were. I never met them before. But the scenery was so vivid, the perspective, like where I was standing and what was around me in the environment was so unique. And so it stuck out and I noticed it. And then I would tell my mom about it because when I was a young kid, we would watch the X-Files. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So that was what we do. We'd watch the X-Files and it was paranormal and it's about aliens and you know, all kinds of weird stuff, ESP and that. So my mom and I could have these conversations. <laughs> and so I was like, mom, I had this dream and it was so real. And my friends were in it and this happened and this happened. And then like a week or two later, I would have that actual physical experience. So I'd be on like a high school trip. It's almost I was like a part- deja vu feeling it must. Yeah. Be. Yeah. But it, I saw, I was, I lived it before it happened and I knew that I lived it. I was shown it on the other side. And I think I was, I know that I was given those experiences to help me really embrace this understanding that we are these eternal beings, that we exist throughout all space and time. Um, I was, I mean, it's a, it's a complete validation when you're shown something and then it happens piece for piece. It happens a few weeks later. And I, and I told my mom about, and I'm like, this is exactly what happened. And sometimes I wrote it down and then it would actually happen. And I was like, I'd go on a field trip and something would happen with my friends and these other kids from another school that we would meet. One time they were kids you didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. They were completely odd experiences that I couldn't understand. Um, one of the one of the best ones was uh, I was in a hotel room and I had two beds and I was sitting towards the, the foot of the bed and my other closest friends were at the head of the bed, like sitting by the pillows and the backboard. And there were some other kids on the left side and the wall by the bathroom was to me on the right side in the hotel room. And I didn't recognize the other kids that were there, but I saw my two best friends And one of my best friends bends over to the side of the bed in that little walkway between the bed and the wall, the bathroom, and he pulls out this giant sombrero, like this huge (laughs) Mexican hat. I mean, it's huge. It's like, you know, three feet wide. It's like what you'd get for your birthday at a Mexican restaurant. And so everybody starts laughing and in the dream, now stuff starts happening. I'm thinking, wow, that's a really strange dream, but it was so vivid and so real. And then a few weeks later, I went on this school trip and we were staying at a hotel when we were at this conference. And we we're not supposed to be in the, the hotel room of other kids from other schools without a chaperone or somebody. But we knew we knew the people there. So we leave the door propped open. And there were like 10 of us in the room. But we we're not supposed to be in there. And so having a dream about it, like your mind thinks, but why would this even happen? I'm not ever going to be in a hotel room with other kids because you're 15 years old or 14 years old. And uh, so then in the real life, my friend reaches down to the bed and I didn't see it there. And he pulls out this sombrero that was tucked behind the bed. And in that moment, you have that deja vu experience and your body gets chills and it's like time freezes. And you're like in this, oh my God state. And they're still moving around and you're frozen and you're like, and you kind of wonder like, are they noticing me right now? Because everybody else is laughing and you're not. Yeah. I'm freaked (laughs) out. My my face might be pale. Like all the blood left it. I'm like, (laughs) oh my God, I had this happen before. And I I can remember exactly the time. Wow. I was having these types of non-physical experiences ever since I was young. And then I was channeling information for school tests and things. I would communicate in telepath. Um, but definitely the out-of-body experiences in meditation and the times I use plant medicine, they it made me embody what it was that is this other reality. I embodied it more. It changed how I live my life. I became very quiet. Um, I, 
I was practicing meditation as well. And I was trying to silence my mind. And there were times where I forgot how to talk. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so sometimes like I really wanted silence and I gave up everything. Like I stopped hanging out with my friends. I stopped doing all my activities and all I wanted to do was meditate all the time. And like, you want to go beyond this reality. Like you want to understand what is this? Because I'm not going to be a human being who just lives and dies, who, you know, gets a job and then dies at the end of their life. Like, what's the point? Like, Although I there's nothing wrong with that. that. <laughs> not at all. Yeah, I'm going to die one day and I have a job, but I want to know more. I want to experience more. And I realized I had a window of time when I'm younger before I, you know, create a career and a family, what else I'm going to do in my life. I have this window where I can dedicate myself completely to this because I was in college at the time. And so I focused on silencing my mind all the time. And what ended up happening, I ended up forgetting how to converse with people. I had nothing in my head to talk about. Um, and I tried different strategies that I would just watch people do. So there was one person in my life and when they were in conversation, they'd always nod their head and they'd go, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. I never did that before. And I started, okay, I'll try this because I don't know what else to do. And I don't want to look so strange when people are looking at me like he's not really saying anything or doing anything. So I just acted interested in whatever was going on. <laughs> and that lasted for a few weeks or months. And then I realized it's inauthentic for me. I, I It's too much work. I don't want to be doing this. And then what started happening later on there was an experience that was real significant for me. Um, I was back from college and I think I was maybe a junior at the time. I think I was a junior and it was winter break, I think, because I came back from college and I have an older brother and he's already graduated from college at that point. And his friends came over and they were all graduated from college as well. And so we were all in the living room of my house and we were all drinking beers together. And we're standing there in the living room in a circle. And there's, I think, four other guys and me. And I knew all of them ever since I was a child. So I was real comfortable with that. And I was always the quiet little brother who just kind of tagged along. So I really didn't, wasn't expected to say anything, but my whole life, I could always feel that these guys kind of like wanted to bring me out into the world. They always, like all of them felt like they were like my big brother. And so they were always inviting me to parties and always trying to like encourage me to become more social because I was an introvert, but I'd go with them to all these parties. I just really wouldn't say much to people. They were all older than me and I was very shy. So I'm standing there in this circle with them and they're all having a conversation about something. And I was waking up really quickly at that point and I could feel this energy moving around the ring of us. And it, whoever was going to talk would light up with energy a few moments before they would speak and I could oh. feel them. Yeah. It, it happens all the time. A good way to practice this. Um, so I would go to these like channelings, like in Sedona where I lived and they would pick a name out of the hat. And before they picked the name out of the hat, I would try to feel who was going to get called on in the room. And I could feel one person and I could see it with my mind light up with energy. Wow. And I knew it was them. And then they'd pick the name out of the hat. They'd say the name. And sure enough, it was that person. And what really confirmed it for me is one time I got called on. And before they picked the name out of the hat, I felt a bubble of energy surround me. And it started to get like very vibrating, really strong, a little anxious, like, whoa, what is this? And then they picked my name out of the hat. And I realized, wow, like the non-physical universe chose me before wow. the name got pulled. Yeah. You know, Sedona is such a special place. I live in um, in the Phoenix area, but one of the big reasons I moved here was because of my love of Sedona. Yeah, yeah Sedona there's a draw. Really there's a draw, right? Yeah. yeah, it's such a beautiful place. I, I moved there after college. I went across the whole country with a friend, did some road trips, and uh, Sedona was this place that called me. So I lived there for 17 years. Oh and, my gosh, that's a long time. Yeah. What year did you start living there? Uh, 2003, I was still in it college, but so I lived during the summer now. there. So yeah, different. It is. It's really different. Um, I used to ride my bicycle, um, like just go I there, hike, just there. hike all day. Yeah. 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 I used to run. I, I had like Jesus hair. And so I, I would <laughs> run with these, <laughs> these running shorts, these little running shorts and bare feet and no shirt and Jesus hair and a beard. And I would just go outside my apartment. And I'd run on the trails every day. 
And so I'd freak out all the tourists because you see this, you know, half naked skin. I was skinny as can be. I was a raw food. This half naked guy running down the trail looking like Jesus. And he it just more like in. Forrest Gump than Jesus to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was me for like five years. Uh, so it was wild. Um, wow. But yeah, Sedona is real, real beautiful. It's a really special place. Uh, so to get back to that story, so you can feel the energy of who's going to talk next. And I could feel it in this group of people. And it was fascinating because I'm just in this meditative state, interacting with the world, sensing what's happening in the energetic reality. And then at one point, I feel the energy go to me. And I knew it's going to be my turn to talk next. And I had like two seconds or three seconds before it was my turn to talk. And I could feel the energy. And at that point, the last person talked and the conversation stopped. And I knew it was my turn to talk. Now, a moment before it stopped, because I'm in this like altered state, like I lived in an altered state where I'm like in the non-physical and perceiving physical life. And I'm able to like communicate with my higher self and I'm while I'm watching life. And before the conversation stopped, I felt the energy and I asked my higher self, it's my turn to talk, isn't it? It said, yes. And it said a sentence for me, one sentence. And I knew I'm supposed to say this sentence. The conversation stops, the energy's around me and I freeze. And I, I never talked in the conversation that whole night. Like I'm a quiet kid. And especially with my older brother's friends, nothing ever, I never said anything and I'm freezing and like four seconds or five seconds goes by. The person directly to my right says the exact same sentence that I heard in my head. The energy then keeps moving around in the circle. It goes off of me and it goes to the next person. And that person talks for a little while and it goes to the next person. And I'm like, whoa. And I was, the universe wanted me to say this. And if I wasn't going to say it, the universe was going to have someone else say it because it needed to be said in the universe at this time. Do you time. remember what it was? It was a simple, dumb, normal sentence. It was nothing profound. It was okay. you know, the kids just drinking beers, talking about life and whatever's going on. And then it happened again. Like two or three minutes later, I could feel the energy come to me. And I'm like, okay, I have to do this now. You know, I'm having a conversation with myself trying to get ready because I need to break through my own fear. And I got the sentence of what I was supposed to say. Sure enough, the conversation stops. There's a pause for like two seconds. And then I was able to muster up enough courage to say what it was I heard. I say that sentence and then it just keeps going around. The energy goes around. Everybody keeps talking. And it was like nobody even noticed. Hmm. No one noticed like the struggle I was having that I had to say what I channeled into my brain as the next normal human sentence of this interaction. And so it was fine. It went off without a hitch. And then I realized like, wow, I can channel because my personality was already like really wiped clean of all this content. So I could channel just normal human things. And that was a way to allow this higher part of myself to come through. And my human brain didn't have to think about what to say. Um, so so will a, you explain who it is that you channel, how you understand <laughs> yeah, who you're channeling? Yeah, it's my greater self. Um, it's called the higher self. And when I started channeling for a long time, I didn't have a name for it. I just called it the universe. I'm talking okay. to the universe. Because okay. I didn't want to, I'm not a type of person who's religious. Like I was raised Christian and I say the word God a lot in my teachings, but for me, it's more like, I don't want to adhere to a certain religion. It's not, you yeah. know, it's about the universal intelligence. Okay. So for me, it's yeah. like, yeah, I'm talking to God or I'm talking to the universe. And then when I started to create the videos, I needed to name it. I mm -hmm. needed to choose a name and it said, call us higher self. Which is interesting because I feel like I have only maybe in the last, I mean, I've been on a spiritual journey for a long time. I've only heard people start to talk about higher self, maybe for the last 10 years, maybe. Yeah. So maybe you coined the phrase. <laughs> um, I uh, I found it referenced before I started, but there was not a lot of information online. I've coined a few things, or at least I've made them popular because I've watched this happen. Well, tell me what you've coined. Like, I'm curious. In my words. <laughs> um, so higher self was around before I said it because I looked it up when I heard it. And there was a book, I think by Edgar Casey. 
oh, about communicating it, with your higher self. Yeah. Okay. You know, when I was sure. 13, my mom got me, uh, made me a member of the Association for the Research of Enlightenment, ARE, which is his organization. I got this big book that had all his channelings and all that, but I, I wasn't really into reading at the time. So I only paged through it a few times. But even then, like channeling was in my life and I was like 13. I never took an interest in it until I was 18. And then I just loved it and I, it consumed everything I was doing. So would you be open to doing a little bit of challenge, channeling, yeah. channeling like a talk so I could <laughs> ask a few questions for the audience? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'll just explain what happens just so everybody sure. knows. Um, so I feel my heart first because that's the center of myself. And in the heart is where we feel our deepest knowledge and our eternal energy. We connect with who we are in our heart. So I go there first and I feel my heart and that immediately starts to increase this feeling of love and energy and me being me. And once I'm in my heart, this line of energy starts to move and it shoots up from my heart and I feel this tube and it's a little, maybe like a half dollar size or silver dollar size. And it goes up through the center of my brain and it goes out the top of my head. And so I'll, my body will kick back as this light moves up. And then this tube is in place and it's going above my head. And when that's there, then I'm channeling from this higher intelligence. I call it a higher intelligence and a higher self because it's actually located higher than my human brain and my human body. Okay. Yeah. In my teachings, I have something called the lower self. The lower self is located below the head down in the torso. And that's your memory-based understanding of who you are. So all of our emotional reactions happen inside our torso area. They happen in the lower five chakras. Okay, So the chakras are these energy centers and they have psychological properties. So all the memory-based understanding of us as a human being is living inside of these lower energy centers. And that's what we hear as our thoughts. And that's what we experience as our emotional reactions. So the lower self, the past belief structure of who I am as a human being talks to me. Well, for me, it doesn't talk to me very much at all because I've silenced it. But for most people, it talks to you and it gives you guidance and it helps you remember how to interpret what's happening right now so you don't feel lost. Okay. I was lost. I, I mean, I could, I knew my name, I didn't have amnesia, but like, and I could access memories, but it wasn't automatically appearing because I was doing the Zen meditation all day long for years. Um, even in college, I would sit there and I would just stare at the professor. And I've had professors tell me to stop staring at them <laughs> because, because I was just meditating with eyes open, but I was super learning. Like I never had to study and I got like a 4.0 in college. Like it was easy because I was just connected in and you just absorb it like a sponge. And then when it's time to take the test, if you're calm and relaxed, you don't have anxiety, you can just pull it out of your memory real easy. Wow. So, yeah. So I was. You should be in teaching this, this in school. Yeah. In college. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. I gave up everything. I, I quit drinking alcohol. I quit doing parties and then all I did was meditate and read spiritual books. And because I read in these ancient teachings that meditation is not something you do just when you're sitting on your cushion for 10 or 20 minutes at a time, you have to try to live this experience. And so I took that seriously. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to have a silent mind and I have to complete school. And I was intelligent my whole life. I'm blessed with intelligent parents and my brothers are intelligent. So I knew that I could succeed in school. My brain knew how to process information, but I wanted to have this spiritual experience. I wanted to awaken to what's beyond the human realm. I didn't care about a job or any of that anymore. I just wanted to be in this meditative state, but I wanted to perform well at school because it's important to me, important to my family. And I need a degree because maybe I'll need a job for it at some point, which turns out I never did. Um, but I made that important enough. So I was focused on the professor and what they're saying as my object of meditation. And that allowed me to like connect with them and understand them and remember what they said. Um, I have a pretty good memory. It's like, it's not completely, um, photographic, but it's really accurate. And I can see some things like a photograph in my mind, or I'll hear things word for word, um, but it's just a matter of us being so present and connected that the brain does what it's supposed to do. And it just records the information. Hmm. Yeah. 
So we have a lower self that remembers everything and it talks to us so we don't forget, so we can have an experience. But the problem is that lower self was conditioned by how the world interacted with us. We learned who we are based upon how the world talked to us and how our parents talked about life and how people interacted with us. So we were given this personality. And that's something that Don Juan in Carlos Castaneda's teachings, he talks about, he says, everyone is given a view of the world and you cannot change it. You cannot um, prevent this happening. Everyone's given a view of the world. And then when you start to wake up, you learn how to stop the world. And he's very mysterious in how he describes that. But fortunately, I was studying Eastern spirituality and Zen Buddhism at the time and reading all of Carlos Castaneda's shaman books. And I put the two together and realized when you stop the world, you stop your understanding of reality. And to do that, you have to stop your thoughts. And the Buddhists, like these ancient monks in the beginning of Zen, they're talking about the exact same thing that these old school shaman are talking about. They're just using different terminology. And so Zen was the practice I used to apply the knowledge I learned from the Toltec shamanism through the teachings of Don Juan. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So we all hold this story inside of us and that's our past self or our lower self, I call it. The present moment self lives in the head. It's crown chakra, third eye and throat area. So okay. if you drew like three circles, you would have your personal self in these three chakras, and then you'd have your lower self overlapping on your throat and then going down to your root chakra. And then your higher self would be the chakras above your head and it would overlap on your crown chakra. And yeah, the so third like, eye as well? Uh, mm, no, it's uh, yes and no. Okay. Uh, no, because... When we first start connecting to our higher self, we just feel it in our crown chakra. Okay. But then it comes down and in, and we can process it in our third eye. Okay. Or we can embody it more and process it in our physical body's lower chakras, like with energy healing, where you feel that like you're channeling the energy through your hands. Well, you can bring it all the way down to your root chakra too and go through your whole psyche. When this happens, you're embodying all of those higher qualities. So essentially, in this example, that ring would expand and start to overlap all of the chakras of the higher self, middle self, and lower self okay. of these three parts of our mind. So that's what has happened to me over these 20 plus years of interacting with my higher self is that level of understanding and that quality of energy has now filled out my personality. And so my personality feels the energy of the higher self constantly. And I live with the understanding of the higher self. Um, it's part of my normal well, life. I, I know, know things, things without, without people, people saying, saying things, things to me. me. I, I see, see somebody, somebody and, and I, can I can tell you, you I, can I can talk, talk like five, five minutes about, about who they are. are. Wow. And, 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 and I just, just by seeing, seeing that, that, I can, I can tell, tell you about, about the quality of their personality, how they understand the world, how they interact with life. Um I can't, I can't tell, tell you necessarily, necessarily where, where they, they were born, or because I know my logical, logical mind doubts, doubts that. that. Um, I, can I can feel that, that resistance, resistance coming up, up. But, but I can, I can tell, tell you like, like everything about, about them non-physically. Um, all, all these characteristics. characteristics. And, and if, if I, go I go into a channel, channel state, then I can bring, bring through more information than what I immediately. This is exactly why I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah. So, so, so I'm learning it because we're still, we're still trying to get as much of our eternal qualities in our human reality as possible. And so we'll notice like the deeper beliefs of resistance, like they start creating a tension in the body, the, the lower chakras, and you feel like, Ooh, I'm afraid of this, or I don't quite trust this. And then it starts to influence the feeling of your head because your head is where you process the past mind and the future mind, the lower mind and the higher mind. So we can live we can use the higher mind information when the lower mind is not interfering with it by doubting it Ooh. or by being afraid of it. So some people I've known try to heal their bodies and they want to use spiritual energy to do so. But then as soon as they start feeling the spiritual energy, they start you becoming afraid. Yeah. yeah. Or you get intuition and you doubt it, like you said. And so there's this conflict that happens and it takes place in our head area where we're trying to integrate the higher mind and the lower mind together so that the lower mind trusts the higher mind. So the lower mind learns from the higher mind because mm -hmm. the lower mind is our human embodied understanding and we're trying to embody and receive more of our eternal understanding. Makes sense. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. All right, so I'll start channeling for you. 
Okay. So while I channel, just, uh, okay, I'll give, <laughs> give you two. And what I do is I feel my heart and I connect. But, and what I tell you to do is just relax and trust this experience. So for anyone who's watching, you may notice changes happen inside of yourself. You may notice energy moving, a quiet mind, intuition, whatever happens, it's just a natural part of the process. You're just trying to connect more with what you are. So just trust this experience. Okay, I'll now begin. Dear one, close your eyes. Feel the center of your chest. Be at peace. Relax into yourself. Relax into the feeling of your heart. Notice this quality of energy. Feel this shining expression. It feels like you shining into life. Thank you so much for allowing us to have an experience with you. One of the questions I'd like to understand is how much of our human experience do we choose before we come here to have it? Hmm. What we can say, dear ones, is that in every moment you are choosing your human experience. The challenge we're having is we're just not aware of all that we are. There are parts of yourself that know you are creating it right now. There are parts of yourself that know what you're creating right now, which will not take place in the world for perhaps a number of years. You are always creating this experience. You're creating it in every moment. Now, as human beings, we tend to believe that the soul is something different than what I am, that it's outside of who I am, that it has information that I can't access. And once we start believing that, we limit our perception of what we truly are. Your reality is being created constantly, and you can have access to what's going to appear. If you believed it, you could ask your higher mind, your higher self, and say, when am I going to have this next relationship? When am I going to have this next career change? Where am I going to live next? Um, you can ask it any questions that you want, and your higher self will give you an answer. The question is, do you trust what you hear? Do you believe you can even receive an answer? For those of you who have difficulty hearing your higher self, it's because your human mind does not yet believe you can have this communication. Some of you doubt that the higher self even exists. Well, there's your limitation right there. You're not bad or wrong for having these limitations. You're in a process of discovery, a process of awakening. You learn from the world and the world told you these things are not true. These things are not real. There are many people in this world who try to convince mankind that spirituality is false, that non-physical things are false. And if we look at the nature of these people's realities, they have reasons to do so. They have reasons why they believe that spirituality is false or wrong. Perhaps they had a past lifetime in which they lost something they loved because of their spirituality, because of their religions. Perhaps they were killed. Perhaps they lost their life because of their religious beliefs. And so now as adults in the present world, they've made it a point to tell everyone that spirituality is false or wrong. They don't have the information, they don't know the truth, but they're speaking from a strong place of past conditioning because the non-physical reality related to past experiences of harm. So we all have our reasons of why we believe and not believe different things. It serves us best to keep an open mind and to ask the universe to show us what is true. Wow. So we hear the term that we are all one. Can you elaborate on that and our connection to each and every person and everything in this world? 
Well, the truth, dear one, is that everything is one consciousness. It appears like infinite forms because the one consciousness is experiencing the qualities of itself. God is infinite. God is eternal. God is limitless. God is all-knowing and all-powerful. So how do these qualities manifest themselves? Well, they have to manifest themselves as an infinite number of experiences existing forever, exploring every possibility and never stopping. We know that we are eternal. We can logically deduce that, but we also perceive the evidence of it in the existence of all the forms. So yes, there are the appearance of separate forms, but they exist inside of this universe. They are created by an intelligence. They are made from an energy. And as we work towards discovering this space, this awareness, this intelligence and energy, science will one day determine that it is all one continual state. It has the power to appear as everything. It has the power to create infinite experiences and infinite perspectives to have those infinite experiences, but never does the expression of its infinite strength reduce its own oneness. So it's all one consciousness. It always has been one consciousness, but it's exploring itself in infinite ways. And that's why it creates infinite forms. Wow. So I think when we come into this human incarnation, a lot of us in this world feel very alone, isolated, like there is nobody helping us. You've just explained how we are intimately connected to God as the consciousness, but we also, I believe, have other help from other beings on the other side. So can you explain and give the people that are listening the hope and to help them understand that they are not alone? Mm -hmm. Yes, what you're really desiring is a feeling of connection, and that feeling we call emotion. You're wanting to experience emotional connection. If we examine the experience of emotion, we realize that it's created by the understanding. So the beliefs that we have are felt as emotional vibrations. We feel emotionally connected when another person shares the same beliefs as us. We think they're my friend because they like the same things I like. They're my friend because we can talk about the subjects that I enjoy. We think that they're my teammate because we like the same sports team or we live in the same town. When we have similar ideas, we feel similar vibration of emotion and we call that connection. The challenge that we have in life is we also have different ideas. Even the people you love most will sometimes think differently about things, and in that moment, you will feel an emotional disconnection. We live in a universe of infinite ideas, so you will feel connected to some things and disconnected from other things. If you just accept that this is how life works, then it will not cause you such difficulty. When you give yourself permission to be who you want to be, to express what you believe, to live the way you want to live, now you're putting your ideas into life. And you'll go on a journey in which you'll allow yourself to interact with people who have similar ideas. And now you'll feel the human emotion of connection. It's not such a great mystery. Many of you feel ashamed of yourself, so you don't allow yourself to live the way you want to live. Many of you believe you're not a good person, so you don't express who you are in the world. Therefore, you don't give yourself the opportunity to attract to you similar people thinking similar ways, having similar emotions that you can feel happiness with. We block our own creative expression, therefore we do not manifest experiences of emotional connection. So on a human level, the solution is really finding peace and self-acceptance for you being you, living the way that feels right for you, making choices and actions based upon your understanding so that you bring your understanding into the world, and then observing how the world is changing its shape. You'll do different activities and you'll interact with different people. And if you're allowing the expression of yourself, you'll find yourself in situations with similar quality people. 
Now, as we said, different emotions arise all the time because people have many different ideas. You must be aware of yourself so you do not quickly jump upon different ideas and then start shaming yourself in the process. In your romantic experiences, people are going to agree with you and people are going to disagree with you. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. In your families and with your children or as adults yourself, you're going to have disagreements. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you or something wrong with them. We have to stop identifying ourselves as the ideas and instead discover ourselves as the consciousness that is creating with ideas. When we have similar ideas, we will feel emotional connection. When we're living how we want to live, we'll feel connected with life. When we're expressing who we are, we will feel a loving relationship with life because we're allowing this connection of ourselves creating our expression into the world. So it's all about, dear ones, allowing an expression of yourself and just noticing how like attracts like. And that's how you'll feel these qualities of human connection and oneness. Thank you for that explanation. That's helpful. What about our connections to the other side, to our soul family that didn't come with us, to our angels and to our guides? How do we discern and understand and better connect to help accept and understand their guidance? Mm -hmm. well, the first thing to realize is that the non-physical beings have a mental body, just like you have a mind. They have an emotional energy body, just like you have emotion. The only difference is you have a physical body and they do not have a physical body. That's the only difference. So how do we interact with them? Well, we have to meet them where they are, which means we have to use our mind. The power of prayer, communicating with telepathic messaging, all of these are ways to use your mind to express thought and direct your thought to the being that you want to interact with. And then the message will be received. In the non-physical reality, they don't have physical forms interfering with them. So they do not have the physical senses causing them to be confused about their non-physical senses. And they don't have physical memories causing them to be confused about the nature of their own personal experience. You have a physical body that gets in the way of your non-physical senses. You have a physical memory that gets in the way of your eternal understanding. So these non-physical beings, they don't have the same blocks that human beings have because they don't have a physical body. If you, dear ones, think of the non-physical being you want to talk with and you send it telepathic messages, they are receiving it. Even if you cannot hear a response, they are hearing you. If you want to be able to hear them, you have to quiet down the body's activity, which means you have to learn to quiet down your human thoughts. If you're listening to your body talking to you, that's your thoughts, then you cannot be listening to another non-physical being talking to you. They're competing for the same space in your attention. You have to learn to quiet your thoughts, and you have to learn to feel yourself as the mental body, which is like the aura, so that you can receive the mental communication that your mental body is having. You have to be aware of what the mental body is doing, so you have to feel like the space of your aura while you create the telepathic communication. I think that that's very helpful so that we can all connect with our, our guidance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you also explain the importance of the ripple effect that we have on the world and with each other? Well, everyone is creating. Everyone is creating. You can think of it, dear one, like kids splashing in a swimming pool. Some kids in a swimming pool, they want to make the biggest waves, so they move their body with the greatest amount of energy. They lift their arms and they slap down the water, creating waves that then ripple out and touch everyone around them. The stronger your desire the more you feel energy being expressed and the more you influence the world. The more you want something, the more your body acts. That's a wave 
coming through your consciousness into the body and moving the body. The more you desire it and know you can have it, the more you allow the expression of yourself to change your body, mind, and emotions. You are an eternal consciousness, and you're creating change in the physical human body that you have. And then the expression ripples even further out into the world. So the ideas you have are rippling into the world and they're moving physical matter. They're moving your body and they're also moving the environment around you. The more you desire it, the stronger your arms are slapping. The more you want it, the more frequently your arms are slapping. And so you will watch your body's expression changing. And that's how you know you are changing your life. If you, dear one, are not creating new actions, if you're not speaking different words, then your body is not receiving from your deeper mind. So the next step is to remove the emotional blockages that are preventing you from taking action on what you want to be doing and having conversations or listening and learning about what you want to be doing. If your body is not responding, then your body's psyche is resisting this deeper intelligence from coming through. So we're all expressing in the world, and the people who resist their expression the least allow for the greatest energy to come into their body and into the world. People who are the most aligned with their desires allow their soul's energy to flow into the world. The stronger your desire, the greater your strength, and the more you will notice you take different actions, you start creating what you want, and then the world changes. If you're blocking it, then you're going to notice your body's not responding. So it's really these two qualities. How much do you want it? And how much do you block it? We reduce the blocks by realizing I'm just here to be me. I'm happiest when I'm being true to myself. So I'm just here to be me. And then honoring yourself as a creator, realizing you are God and you came here to create, that can empower the strength of your energy. You should honor your desire to create the best life for yourself. You should honor your desire to celebrate yourself in this world. That will increase the strength at which you're creating these waves into the world. Wow. I think that your explanation of that touched a little bit on manifestation. So can you elaborate a little bit more on the methodology for us to best manifest what we truly desire in our lives. Mm. We like to describe the process of manifestation in observable ways. Sometimes human beings are confused because they're learning concepts that they cannot observe at work. Like we said, your body will respond to your intentions, to your beliefs, and to the strength of your desires. So you'll think about things more when you desire them more. You'll feel the emotion changing in your body when you desire it more. You'll make physical choices when you desire it more. You'll perform physical actions and you'll interact with the world around you when you desire it more. You will observe, just by watching your body's behavior, how powerfully you are creating the life that you want. So, so much of this is really about noticing that you are taking your human body on a journey to manifest the experiences that you want to give to your human body. You want a relationship. Well, your body's going to be part of that. You want a new home. Your body's going to be part of that. You want a career. It's your body that's going to work. You, of course, are expressing through your physical body, but you're taking your body into that physical experience. You are an eternal consciousness creating a physical experience. Like we said earlier about making waves in the world, the strength of your desire determines how much energy comes into the world of form. Desire is creative energy. God desired to have an experience and the universe was made. You are God creating in a personal universe, creating in your own life. And your desire makes the universe. Your desire determines the experiences you're having. Now, we are all God together. God is experiencing itself in infinite perspectives. So all the souls in existence are all connected together. And we're creating the same universe from infinite perspectives. So we're like kids in a swimming pool, all making waves, all splashing about. 
We're all manifesting this universe together, not just the world, but the entire universe and all the dimensions. So the more powerful you are, the more of an influence you have on the waves of that swimming pool. Your job is to recognize that you are life's creator, to find that energy, to find your desire, and to allow yourself to feel it as emotion. Allow yourself to think about it and process an understanding based upon creating what you want. Sometimes as human beings, we, we hold on to doubt and fear, and then we expect the universe to give it to us. That's not going to work because you're the creator. And if you're doubting that you can create it, wanting someone else to create it for you, you're putting on the brakes to your own manifestation. Of course, the universe loves you. If you believe you can have it and God will give it to you, you can create life that way also. But if you have doubt about yourself as a creator, while you also want the universe to create it for you, that's what's applying the brakes. That's what's slowing it down. So we can manifest any way. We truly can. We're that much God. But when we doubt that we have this ability, that's what creates the interference. Non-physically, the universe is designed to manifest what you want. You, dear ones, have to align with yourself. So remove those limiting beliefs and let yourself go on the journey of exploration as you express yourself as God and watch how the world responds. Oh, that's very helpful. I hope that everybody heard those messages and can implement them. I think the last question I will ask you is, I think a lot of times in our human incarnation, we feel very powerless. We feel like the world happens to us. I do understand the power of our soul. So will you speak to everybody listening about how powerful they truly are? Yes. Well, first, dear ones, feel your heart. Because this is the source of your creative energy. That which is most important to you, you know it in your heart. When you're doing what you love, what is most important to you, you feel it in your heart. Your heart is the manifestation of your soul's creative energy. The more you love life, the more you love expressing yourself, the more you love participating in life, the stronger your heart energy grows. With greater heart energy, your body feels it, your mind awakens, and you influence the world around you. Every human being desires happiness, and we are all creators of happiness as we allow the expression of ourselves into the world. You're made of love. And if you allow the expression of yourself without doubt, fear, shame, and guilt, you will express and your heart energy will come through you. And you'll share it with your words and your actions and you'll light up the people around you. And because everybody's wanting happiness, everyone will enjoy having conversation with you. You see, we often, dear ones, feel separate because we make ourselves separate because we shame ourselves and thus separate ourselves from the creative experience. But if we support the creative experience and just notice the design of life, all you're doing is letting yourself be you and letting yourself come into the world of form. You're going to find people that think different. That's okay. You're going to find people that think similar. That's okay as well. Let yourself go on the journey and you'll vibrate in alignment with those that are similar and you'll interact with them more. And those that are different, you'll just move away from them. But if you have guilt, shame, doubt, or fear, you'll resist your intuition guiding you towards people that are similar and guiding you away from people that are different. You don't shame people who are different. That's not a wise thing to do. You just understand we're all creating differently and that's okay. The more you align with yourself, letting yourself be you, feeling like you can shine your light, the more you will feel that power of your heart expressing into the world, and the more you will shape your life with love. So make, dear one, the realization of yourself as a creator an actual experience that you are perceiving. We thank you, dear one, for this opportunity to speak with you. We wish you love and light, peace and happiness as you continue to celebrate yourself. Namaste. 
Oh, Lincoln, thank you so much for connecting to your higher self and sharing those beautiful and very empowering messages with everybody who's able to listen. So I want you to have an opportunity to explain where people can connect to you, because I'm sure after hearing this, some, some of the people watching will want to connect with you more personally. How do they do that? Yeah, yeah. thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Um, so my website's channelhigherself.com. And you can also find me on YouTube. And the name of the YouTube channel is Channel Higher Self. Um, I have, yeah, like you said earlier, 2,600 videos or so on YouTube. Um, lots and lots of free content. If you go to my website or YouTube, you can search by keyword and you can find the different topics that interest you. I also work with people one-on-one. -on -one, so I do personal sessions over the internet. Um, on occasion, I will do in-person events and workshops or retreats. And then I also have a class that I teach every Sunday. So for three hours every Sunday, I teach you and I channel for you. And there are three month long classes. So we choose a topic and then we develop teachings around that topic for the three month period. So for example, we just started one and it's learning how to silence the activities of your mind <laughs> using meditation and other things I've learned along my own journey. So for three months, you work with me every day on Zoom, and then you're given teachings and a guided meditation. The meditation's a recording, and you're supposed to use that every day of the week so you can keep developing yourself during this course. Then we meet again on Sunday, you get another teaching, another meditation, and it builds knowledge and also this ability that we're working towards in this class. So that's another thing that I do. And people have done that. I've experienced a lot of transformation. Oh, um, I hear all the time messages that people are completely different per people than they were before they started working with these higher self teachings. So I'm real happy about that. Wow. And I'm sure the people that are drawn to will find you just because that's how it works. That's how it works. Yeah. That's how it works. <laughs> Lincoln, you are just a beautiful soul. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your energy and your wisdom. I know you've put a lot of work into all that you've learned. And I just feel so grateful that we got to spend some time to learn your perspective and hopefully um, be able to implement some of the amazing lessons that you're teaching. Yeah, thank you, Laurie. I'm very happy to have this opportunity and I had a wonderful talk with you. I'm glad we had to, we were able to go into some really interesting and maybe mind-blowing areas of, of our experience. That's always a lot of fun. And I hope that everybody got a lot of benefit out of this because I know we loved creating it for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.